So I'll start. I'll, I'll introduce myself, and then Stephen can introduce himself. My name is Monica. I'm a flute teacher at uh, Community Arts, and um, and we've been doing this series of, of classes, and this one is on mastering your performance and mostly performing society. Um, so Stephen, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Stephen Evans, and I am a uh, piano and cello instructor at um, Center for Community Arts. And um, I, I'm, I'm personally very interested in this topic. So I'm, I'm glad that there's so many of you here. I think this is a very important thing to discuss for performers. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Because, you know, I don't know about, about you, but like, you know, sometimes I think about performance anxiety kind of like the Olympics. Okay, so like when I, when I was ever was, I would be watching the Olympics, I would, I would think about, you know, the amount of preparation that was actually needed to get there. But they, the commentators, they would always tell you when you're watching the, when you're watching them, they would always express that, um, that it wasn't always the best athlete that won it. Sometimes it was just the one that performed the better, the one that was able to manage through the stress and anxiety and, and bigness of the event and actually perform in that moment, the moment that counted, the very, very best, right? Um, so that, that's something that I always thought about when I was studying is this, this concept of comparing um, musicians to athletes, which is, which is an interesting, because we kind of are athletes. What do you, don't you think, Stephen? Like I, I absolutely agree. And in fact, um, my, uh, one of my uh, very best teachers used to do tons of sports analogies with us. And she was always comparing everything we were, we were doing to sporting events. And, and, and I agree completely. I think that when you're about to perform, you know, it's like you've reached the Olympics. It may not be the real Olympics, the big, big Olympics, but it can feel that way, you know, to us personally as we're performing. Yes, I'm, I'm about to perform and it's, a big mountain I've had to, you know, climb. Right. Yeah. Um, so have you ever had any like experiences? Like what, if, like how does, how has like performance anxiety affected you and your personal, we'll do a little, we'll do, we'll share a little bit of us and then we'll talk. About sure. Questions. Sure. So, and, yeah. You know, it's been really interesting. I'll, I'll share two really, uh, you know, they were very significant to me in my development. Um, the first one was, um, you know, I think it was in high school and I was trying out for a uh, competition. I think it was a scholarship kind of thing. And I was playing a piece and in the middle of the piece, it, there was just a blank. I had no idea what would come next. I had no idea what to play. My fingers stopped moving. There was no muscle memory. There was nothing. And I mean nothing, right? And I struggled. I tried my best. And then I realized I, I can't do this. So I stopped. And um, later on, one of the judges approached me and said, you did the right thing. There's nothing worse than just trying and trying over and over to you know, come back from something when you just, and, and he said, I could tell, you, you just didn't even know almost what day it was. You know? So I had completely forgotten that. And that was a little devastating. You know, it was a little bit like, wait, I, I can play this piece fine normally. So what had happened that made it such a bad performance? Um, and then another performance, um, which was kind of the opposite of that, uh, was it was my first, we, we, we called them juries, but it was a thing you have to do in college as a performance major. You have to play something fairly difficult in front of the, the music faculty, and then they either pass or fail you. And you know, you're walking into the unknown. So, I remember being extremely nervous backstage, right before I walk out on stage. And I remember my hands were sort of shaking like this. And I'm thinking, oh gosh, you know, this isn't good. I have this hard piece to play. And here I am shaking away. And I remember um, at the time I was doing a lot of work uh, on a swim team. And the coach always used to say, breathe, just breathe. And so something in my head said, breathe. And I started taking these really deep breaths and all of a sudden my hand was just perfectly still, nice and calm and I walked out on the stage and I felt like, well, I know all these faculty. I've had classes with all of them and I felt really comfortable and I played very well, you know, 
and it was it, it might not have been as comfortable but in that moment that I told myself to breathe that's what really I think saved it mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. interesting yeah I'll get into a breathing thing in a in a second since and then we'll but yeah I have you know I think we've all all musicians athletes and performers of all kinds have had moments where it just wasn't our very very best and um you know the power of the mind the mind is so incredibly powerful that it can it can create scenarios and and tell you stories and things that that you know can really affect you you know in your performance and, and it might not even be a bad performance but you know what gosh what your brain can tell you in the in a, in a moment's performance can be you know can be really distracting so for me uh, I did pretty well with performing anxiety, but you know, I, I have, I've, I certainly have had my moments. I've had the blank out moment, you know, like you have, where like all of a sudden, and here's why this happened though. And as I, I tell all my students to not do this, and sometimes I still do this, but you shouldn't do this. It was one, if you have to do something from memory, you know, it's always a kind of a stressful thing. Am I going to forget it? Even though you've played it hundreds of times, you know, at home, you, like your brain can tell you, but what if you forget it? That'll be that one time you're going to forget it. And so, right in the practice room before I was when I was playing and practicing of course I was going over the hardest section the section that I was afraid I might forget like over and over and over again and of course what happens I freaked myself out and that was the section and right before they came to get me for my audition um, they did that so I always tell people and it was, it was a hard lesson learned don't like you're not going to in that last final minutes you're not going to learn it any better don't do that that's like not the thing to do but I, I had to do that, and of course, I was playing. That was in my mind as soon as I went on stage. I'm like, man, what is that section? You know, I'm just I'm blanking on it. I'm totally blanking on it. And I got to it, and of course, what happens is it's it's gone. It was gone, and you know, it it seemed catastrophic at the moment. But you know, I just let the piano play, stood there, you know, and eventually it came back around again, and I I, I joined back in and. And it was it was all fine, but you know, in that moment, it, those seconds can seem like you know eternity when you're just standing okay. there, and it's like nothing is happening. You know, you, you totally have forgotten it. So there, and then there's been more minor moments. But I, I will say that one thing that I have found challenging is the inner voices in my head, and and sometimes they're not even they're not even distracting thoughts. They're just passing thoughts and so how many thoughts you have a minute there's a there's a, there was a study that says how many thoughts we have like a minute that are just like you know just arbitrary things going through your head but somehow when you're performing all those things become really loud in my head and all of a sudden I'm thinking about like why are you thinking about dinner stop thinking about dinner you need to be thinking about this piece and then I'm, I'm actually arguing with my own head and of course I'm not focusing on what I'm you know doing so my best technique the thing that grounds me the most while i'm actually performing and then stephen and i will talk about some things to do before but while i'm actually performing is to sing the music super loud in my head and the more nervous i am the louder i sing in my head that way it push it begins to push things out like this rather than telling yourself not to think about it because of course like if you tell yourself don't think about the pink elephant in the room. You think about a pink elephant in the room. You know, like it's, it's just one of those things that you can't, our human brains are hardwired in such a way that it, it's, it's hard to not think about something when you've actually, when you're, you're thinking about that thing. But we all know our piece. You, you, by, hopefully by the time you perform something, you have gone through it so many times that you, you kind of know how it sounds in your head. And so you can sing along. And you know, if you're using your music, look at the music, sing along, and that will hopefully focus you a little bit more to like be able to, to ground yourself a little bit with that. Yeah. Um, so what, maybe we could talk about some of the physical things that happen so that we can like, we can talk about like what to do. Like, what do you do? Cause it, it, it human nerves are like actually they're actually kind of helpful if you can if you can ground yourself and do that there is such a thing as an energy energy that's in anxiety because what all it is is it's adrenaline so if you break it down to its barest form adrenaline is like the, the drug that our body gives us to when we need to be more alert you know it's it's meant for the things like you know if you need to outrun a tiger you know in, in history if you need to outrun a tiger or you need to pull a car off a baby those are things that, that that's the same exact hormone the same exact drug that you're getting before you're going into a performance but of course you're not in any real danger so that but your body doesn't know that you have to control it from your mind your body is getting that dose of adrenaline some of us get it more 
than other times or like there might just be a time that you get you get it more than other times but it's all the same thing so if you first acknowledge what it is that it's just it's just you know your body's actually giving you more of this energy then we can regulate it a little bit more and put it in perspective so that you can you can ground yourself what what, what are some of the physical things that happen with cello players that that or well, your students that that you've worked through yeah you know that's that's great you know one of the things that i think about all the time and especially playing two different instruments because they can be different experiences playing uh you know and 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 going back and forth between them but uh, one of the things that I love about what you're saying is, is that um, as you perform and as you get more used to performing, you can actually use that adrenaline to give you a better performance. Um, and I'll share with you guys uh, one of the most famous cellists, um, Pablo Casals, actually said one time in a master class, uh, somebody asked him, they said, you know, well, you know, do you ever have nerves? And he said, oh, terrible terrible nerves. Every time I'm about to go out on stage, I'm nervous and all that. And so they asked him, well, you know, what should, why would you have nerves? You're the greatest cellist in the world. Why on earth would you have that? And he said, the day I don't have nerves, I will stop playing. Mm -hmm. Because that means to me that I don't care enough about my performance, that I'm not going to give a good performance. And this is a real tough thing because, you know, there is like 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 Monica was saying. There's always that tendency of the voices in your head to you know they, they can be negative and very debilitating when you're trying to perform. And so what you have to learn how to do is turn that around and say, "This is going to be great. I make I'm I'm nervous because I'm going to be good. I'm nervous because I'm going to put all that energy that I'm getting from my nerves into my performance." And that's what I've been training for. And that's something I'm always telling myself too. Mm -hmm. um, but physically, just so, um, so, you know, so one of the things in cello is, you know, we have to have a very, what we call a steady bow arm. You know, just like I'm sure in, in flute, you know, it's all about breathing and a steady air column coming into the instrument. And for us, so this is making our sound. And if that starts getting nervous, you know, you're sunk, you know, you, you, you aren't gonna be making that really, really good sound. So that's something you have to learn how to really be, you know, focused on not letting shaking start, you know. Breathing seems to help a lot. Also, I think uh, very important is, um, you know, I, for, for lack of a better word, diet. You know, what you're, what you're eating and what you're doing before your performance, you know. Uh, you you, you got to kind of not eat a really heavy meal, but also don't be, um, I, I found this out the hard way once at a performance I hadn't eaten for hours, you know, cause I thought, well, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna make me feel, you know, jittery and all that. And it's also, you know, your digestive system is working hard when you're, you've eaten a meal. So I thought I'll just, you know, free myself up from that. Well, you know, then you get to the performance and you don't have the endurance and the energy to do it, you know, yeah. so. I felt a loss of power at, at that point, and that was not fun. Yeah. Um, so, the, like, the things that happen, like, there's some things that you can do before. Like, I like what you said, the, the very basics of, like, diet and, and hydration. And, and, you know, even in this orchestral book, the very preface of this of this orchestral book that I'm, that I'm thinking of, the first thing she talks about is what to do with auditions. Like, so if you're traveling, if you have to travel somewhere, um, you know, and, or you're just going to be in a different type of a climate, if you're doing college auditions or anything like that, think of think through all the things you could possibly encounter. Um, you know, the drier environment for flutes, it's gonna be a big thing to, if your lips dry out, so, you know, make sure you bring Carmax, make sure you're drinking extra water, arrive a little bit earlier, you know, go through every process in your head, the basics, because sometimes the very basics can actually, you know, be the thing, the thing that that, that inhibits your one moment, because you, you only get this one moment, right? Not to put pressure on that one moment, you know, it's, it's but it, it is, it is, you want to, you want to be able to do your best in that one moment, and to be able to feel good about it. So like, just the feeling of feeling good, 
flutists or females wearing super high heels when you need to be standing you know you're it's not the smartest move it might look cool but it is it is really for most people not the smartest move what you're going to wear are you going to be comfortable because all these things in the moment but you want to you want to do something that that you you feel good and even if it's a blind audition which means no one is looking you want something that you feel good in because if you feel good you you can you can actually you know um make your performance much more enriched if you're actually feeling better and then yes like steven said you know prepare for the things that might not you might not have control over put yourself if you're feeling like if you're a person that gets nauseous before you're you you go in to perform maybe pack some saltine crackers or something that will just help settle your stomach a little bit um to me if you're a person that feels like they get dry mouth make sure you have a water bottle bring it on stage with you there is nothing wrong with taking water on stage and drinking it maybe before you are about to perform or even between movements or or things like that that's like you know just being really smart about your about your process right so what do you Either do for me, uh one thing that i uh, and and you, you you slightly mentioned this but it's hugely important for me is that i get there with plenty of time to spare. So, you know, you don't want to be rushing around at the last minute if you're about to perform. I like to, I, I usually err on the side of extremely early, especially in the Bay Area, because, you know, in the Bay Area, you just never know uh, trying to get anywhere. But then that gives me time to sort of settle and, and you know, feel what the space is like. You know, I can feel what kind of acoustic the place has. Um, and also, I can think about how I'm going to perform. You know, what what am I going to play? How am I going to play it? And I can get more focused mm -hmm. on things. If you're rushing in at the last minute, it's an almost guarantee thing that you're not going to be able to play your best. Yeah. You know? So what do you think about, because I know there's some people that do the, the California Music Educators solo and ensemble, and that particular competition, you can actually go in and listen to the judge give you, give the other people feedback. Is that helpful or not? Or do you think that's personal? I think um, I would go with your gut feeling. Some people thrive on that kind of thing and they really enjoy that. They also might like to see what the judge is saying. So they get a feel for the judge. You know, in fact, I've, I've hauled a student in there once before she was extremely nervous. And I had, I had accompanied for about eight students at that point, and this judge was so nice. She was the nicest judge ever. So I brought the student in with me and I basically said, just listen to her, listen to how nice she is. And it, was, it worked a miracle. She was able to play beautifully uh, when her turn came. On the other hand, some people may feel that that's a big distraction. You know, mm -hmm. takes me away from my performance. I really just want to focus on what I'm doing, my performance. So I think you you would probably want to just look inward and say, thing. yeah, what's going to work for me? And it might even be what's going to work for me today or right, right now, right. you know, because some days you might feel very open to watching a judge and other days you might feel like, no, it's going to make me really nervous. So. <laughs> You know. Yeah, and it's always an interesting thing, the judging aspect. And so so personally, I like to go into those rooms and I encourage my yeah. students, a lot of my students to do that. And because it's such a different thing than a recital performance, because I mean, come on, they got like got a pen, piece of pencil and paper and like every like they're just like writing and, and doing this thing. And like, what are you writing there? Like, it's, it's really hard to like not to let that distract you. So if you see them doing it with other people, you can, you know, you can kind of prepare for that because um, that's a different thing. Usually, you know, you're, you know, the, the aspect of being judged is a little different than just like performing for a recital, which is a different type of experience. So just kind of knowing what you're getting into is, is helpful in that regard. Information. I think information is powerful, but I think you're, you're right. That it's, it's probably like, you know, if you have to know yourself um, and know that, you know, that, that that would be helpful to me right now or this is not helpful me and it's a lot of like we go back to the positive self-talk right what do you need right now it's like nurturing yourself what is what is wrong right now how can i make you feel better in this and i just want to put like this the thing about arriving early is so important i mean that's what actually makes me the most nervous and and this does this goes beyond just music things guys this is like you know just life things every any important life thing that you could possibly um have is like you know prepare for extra time because if you were running into some place and you're kind of distracted there's no way you can speak perform um or really get 
be able to do your absolute very very best if you're if you're worried about you know finding the place or or you're just kind of frantically going in so i want to talk about Oh, I, that's okay. I was just going to say, especially in relation to either, uh, the, you know, the CMEA or any of those types of things, you know, a lot of times it's at a place, say, you know, it's Cal State East Bay, or it's some location that you're not used to getting to, you don't know where the building is and stuff. And so yes, absolutely. That's, that's, I think that's hugely important, you know, yeah. for, for those kind of things. And, and yeah, you know, being able to, uh, you know, have that time. It's, it's really precious time if you can just kind of sit there and, and even, you know, for, for people who, with, that it works for, you know, meditate and actually just focus your mind on mm -hmm. this is what I'm here for. I've actually, uh, lots of times, I'll just take my music and I just kind of look at it. And I'm not really trying to play it in my head, but I am sort of imagining what is this mm -hmm. performance going to be like? What's it going to be like when I walk out on that stage? You know, and talk about having information. I'll, I'll share a, a personal story that, that happened to me. I uh, was playing for a, uh, uh, it was a trio, piano trio. And they told us, oh, we're gonna play at this place uh, in Southern California. And I said, wonderful, wonderful. Well, a little bit later on, somebody let's drop the information that it's the Redlands Bowl, which holds 7,000 people and they were expecting 7,000 people there that night. Mm -hmm. And so that changed completely my relationship with that. And I'm glad I knew that because if I had just walked out on stage and all of a sudden, oh my God, there's 7,000. I mean, of course you can't count that right away, but nonetheless, you know, you're expecting maybe a hundred and then you see this vast audience, you know, that's, that's a big difference. Yeah. And you need a... to, you know, you need to mentally prepare for things like that. No, you know, how am I going to walk on this stage and how am I going to, you know, present myself? That, that's a really, that's, if you can imagine that, and that goes to the, the, the positive self thought, but it, that's another aspect of it. That's really, that's really powerful. If you can imagine yourself being successful at something, I think that that can be really powerful and that's yeah. that's but all this takes kind of practice this kind of mind thing because it's 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 i can imagine that some people are sitting there going okay that's all nice and like you know they think think good things you know be, be good thoughts but what do i do when my hand is shaking and i just can't play my piece of music like you know that kind of that kind of thing so are there things that you can do in the moment like and i i'm sure this is specific to every instrument like um Handshaking and knee shaking is kind of a hard one. Um, so is there anything you tell your students to do that that, that helps with the, sh the, the shaking aspect? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, breathe. That's usually a, a huge help. Um, even if you're, you know, like, like Monica, you play uh, flute, so you have to breathe, you know. But for us, you know, we need to breathe too. And so reminding yourself that. Also, I find it's really, really helpful uh, for me, when I'm feeling, you know, that little bit of uh, or, or shakiness, I just remind myself, you know this, you got this. Don't worry about it. You've, you've, yeah. you know, yesterday's practice was great. The day before was great. The day, but what makes you think this will be different? This will mm -hmm. be fine. You're going to be fine. And I, I, I sort of, you know, give myself a pep talk whenever mm -hmm. that's happening, you know, and I've done that in the middle of playing, you know. Right. Yeah. And that's a really good point. The one thing I, I, I always try in a um, kind of like solution based, based things and what, if the breathing and the, and all that's, that's just, and you're still a little bit shaking cause they're there. I do a check-in with my body. Like how is my body my muscular going? Because sometimes if I'm really rigid, like, you know, so when we're, when we're in that fear state or sometimes our body tends to tense up a little bit more and imagine that like you, you're like, if you're, if you're trying to make your, if your hands are la like in a locked position, you're going to imagine you're going to shake that you're going to shake a little bit more. Cause you're like, you're rigid. Right. And so how to get your, your, your energy and your body to be relaxed. Um, sometimes as simple as like bringing my shoulders up to my ears and letting them drop down and then re reminding myself, regardless of what instrument you have on flutes, just making sure that you're in a weightless quality, that the flute is feeling light in your hands. Sometimes that can make it so that you're not shaking as much. Cause if I'm holding it like this, all of a sudden what I call the death grip is like, you know, I'm going to be shaking more that it can like, sometimes I can like, I, I feel like 
I'm exhausted for the student when they're 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 there. I could see the shoulders are so tight, and and that so you're just in this fixed position. And so sometimes just going through a body checkup, where am I? Can I can I relax anything anymore? And if you know, because everyone it affects different. Some people don't have a problem with shaking, but they have a problem with dry mouth or like you know the thought or the fuzziness and all those other things. If you're a person that 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 feels like they're shaking a lot. One thing I like to, to do is in my practicing, I might actually imagine how I'm going to break that up. Maybe if you're standing, this is not for piano or, 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 or cello, but if you're standing, experiment with shifting your weight a little differently, bring your, your, forward, your, your weight to your front foot and then to your back foot. But I bet you can do that seated as well. You can just kind of take yeah. your, your, yeah. your body weight and kind of shift it this way. Make sure you're not sitting in this isometric position. Arms and body weight is incredibly, we're all tight. Like, you know, like just as I did that, I'm, I'm tight right now just from, from sitting at a computer or, or, or anything like that. So before you go on, maybe doing some stretching, if that helps, gentle stretching, that could actually help even if you want to incorporate it with breathing. That's just to kind of bring some, some looseness to the muscles as you're doing this. But in the moment, maybe you can check in with how you're holding your instrument or how you're holding your shoulders, and that might loosen some of that up. And like, oh, I didn't realize I was holding so much tension there. So if you're a, if you're a person that's shaking, you know, know that. And this is different. This can be like just not instruments. I remember watching someone um, doing a speech, and they had a one piece of paper, and it was so obvious. And I so felt for them because I could I, the the piece of paper was just like it was shaking so much, it was rattling, you know. And I'm like, just set the paper down, set the paper down, you know, just set it down, because then it all, all you know, as soon as you set that down, that would have been fine, you know. Find a podium, find a music stand, find something. Know yourself well enough that you can like you know. You, you could you could alleviate some of that that thing that goes there but you know so but shaking is one thing that um, you know I, it probably it probably feels really big to you and it might be enhancing some of your performance if you're shaking but your audience doesn't really see it I also have students that I'll, that I'll say like you know I was shaking so bad and I and I I didn't really see that. I didn't see that. You know, it felt big to you because you were experiencing it, but the audience doesn't do that. And I only say that because sometimes that becomes the nerve factor. Other people see that I'm so nervous. They see, you know, did you know? That's a very common question. Did it? Did I seem like I was really nervous? Did I seem like this was like really big, a big deal for me? And most of the time, it doesn't. You know, it, that experience with a piece of paper was a pretty obvious one. Um, and it wouldn't have been if they put it down, if they put the piece of paper down, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been that type of a thing. So really stretching, I, I think helps with that shaking thing and, and knowing yourself well enough to practice that, that, you know, that shaking thing. Yeah. And, what about, sorry. I would just add for, um, you know, four seated instruments, just to, to reiterate that, yes, you know, releasing tension here in the shoulders, especially on piano when we have, you know, these wide spans we have to cover sometimes, you know, just being very free through here. And even I'll do things like that right before I'm about to play just to loosen up in there. And uh, another thing uh, that, that I think is, is kind of on the cute side of things, but it's worked beautifully for a lot of my students. I tell them when they're about to do a recital and they've got enough family members, I say, start playing your piece and have various members of your family come in and either try to scare you, make you laugh, make you, you know, react. And you just keep playing your piece so that they can get that experience of like being slightly unsettled with their piece, but yet making making it through, you know. And, and sometimes it turns into a, a, a lot of uh, fun for the kids because they're, you know, they're trying to like, you know, throw the, uh, the student off, but you know, it's it's great to imagine what might go wrong and then also to have survived things going wrong and nothing really that bad happened i was still able to make it all the way through my piece with really nothing bad happening so i'm not afraid anymore yeah you know? good point good point and because that's a question i get a lot too what if i screw up you know x fill in the blank you know so what you screw up and that's you know life will go on the next day the sun will still set you know it might feel like a big thing in the moment but but every single time you know there's that quote and i wish i would knew who say it but like you know every failure is a pathway it's an, a stone to success because you have to allow yourself to fail because if you don't allow yourself to fail you will never succeed you know if you're going to walk so cautiously and and 
in performing that you're not going to take any risks you're also not going to grow as much as a as a as a player because it is the the art of performing is is a practice right you have to you have to be able to put yourself out there and accept that you, you might not have a perfect performance and this goes for speech and you know like it's it's the number one fear beyond death and that was like that's always a like a, a shocker to me that public speaking is a bigger fear than death you know and um and it's that i think it's that experience of like feeling like you're so vulnerable you know you're so out there um in the fear of everyone looking at you and and judging you and and, and that and that and if you can kind of get over that that you know if you if you mess up it's not a big deal it really is not a big deal life will continue to go on so that's that's that mindset thing that that's that's there absolutely and you know, just to add a little thing in there, um, you know, my uh, my uh, piano teacher had this recording that she made me listen to, and I loved this. It was and it taught me a lot about what do you do when things just don't go well. So she's playing this extremely difficult uh, sonata by Prokofiev, and uh, all of a sudden, she realized in her performance that she just didn't know what came next. So she's playing along, playing along, uh-oh, uh-oh, I don't know what's next. And she thinks, you know what? Just restart, go back to the beginning. So she made it sound like there was this natural repeat written into the music. And you know, on this recording, and it was great that it was recorded, hmm. you couldn't, I mean, if you didn't know, if someone hadn't told you that this was what was happening, you just thought it's perfectly natural. There wasn't even a moment's pause. So that's a, a thing you can do. You can also, kind of, if you if you feel comfortable with it, kind of improvise a little something on the chord that you happen to be on and tell you, oh, now I know what to do. And then you, mm -hmm. you can, can leave it. But there's always something you can do. And that kind of stuff takes away from that, uh, you know, that very debilitating thought of, what if I mess up? There's, it, it basically the, the second thing that you're stating there is if I mess up, that's the end. Nothing, you know, I can't recover from it. Not at all. You can recover from a million things. You know, and that's also what you you should tell yourself is, mm -hmm. okay, so that happened, but I'm still fine. I could recover. Mm -hmm. you know. Good point. Yeah, good point. And yes, and 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 you know, I I think that those those are things like the improvising or thinking about the repeat. Those are come those come from more experience of playing. That would be hard to do if that was like a beginning, like you know, right. one of the first couple. This is where the like the the experience of performing more. That that actually helps because you you you've, you don't you know the piece so well and and you know you you're able to you're able to like think quick. It's kind of like making up you know talking on the spot. It's kind of the the same same idea from that. But that's not something that probably comes right away. It takes it takes a little no. bit more time. That's a professional that yeah. that, that that has that that experience there. Um, what about heart rate? So like you know the the natural thing with anxiety or like you know that you're getting nervous. The idea of nerves. Um, is the heart rate goes up. What kind of things do, do, do you or your students experience when your heart rate goes up? Just yeah, that. you know, um, it's, it's interesting because one of the things that I've noticed a lot, everybody says dry mouth, even though we're not really involving in, in our instruments, our, our, our mouth, but nonetheless, that really happens, dry mouth. And then, you know, when that heart rate goes faster, it's, I believe anyway, it's harder to think, to, to, to process thoughts. It sort of gets in the way, you know, and I think probably, you know, as a survival mechanism, the brain is thinking more about, come on, we need to lower this heart rate here because this is not good, you know? Mm. So I think more of the brain power starts going towards that rather than towards your performance, you know? Mm. Um, and it can be, I, I've, I've had it happen before where it's, it's very, very apparent that my heart rate is a little too much for, you know, what mm -hmm. I'm doing. Again, I try, I try to do things to calm myself down or breathe, you know, so that I can, you know, get that heart rate getting back down. Right. What about tempos? That yes. Like that? yes. <laughs> we all know uh, that, know. right? It's like, it's like tempo, like becomes like, you know, all of a sudden, you're, you're, you prepared at one tempo and you're like off to the races. And yes, yes. that could sometimes be a good energetic thing if you can handle it. 
anything you do to like combat that like knowing if, if that's a tendency that you have because everyone has different tendencies nerves affect people differently so it's right. like the, this is where again performing experience is is helpful because you can note after performance you might not remember everything you did in a performance that's quite common i think it's like you know you, you need some of it is a little bit blurred but like you know what your physical things were what what happened to me in this performance how did i feel afterwards and yeah. if, if, if tempo is one of the things because of your heart rate, like there, there may be some things that you can do for the next one that can better inform it. Is there anything that you would do? Like, yeah, for me, I, I know that, you know, because, you know, I'll, I'll get a slightly elevated heart rate and I know that I'm going to take things faster. That's just the way I am. Mm -hmm. And so what I know to do is I play at a tempo that seems in the moment slow. It seems like this isn't quite as fast as what I was doing. But what I know is that, no, when I listen back to this recording, it'll be right up there with that full tempo. Because you like I just slow it down your head. Like, you know, like I, literally I you just take your time and, and, and slow it down. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And also that. even for, um, I notice this a lot when I'm, if I'm doing um, any kind of performing and I also have to speak, I speak a million miles a minute and I have to say, no, 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 no. <laughs> You know, comment down there. They don't want to hear you mumble a bunch of words. You know, mm -hmm. and there's another thing. Uh, one of one of my uh, uh, best experiences in a master class uh, was listening to uh, a flutist, Jean Pierre Rampal, and he said one of these things that just stuck with me all my life, which was, you know, when you play too fast, you're the, I think the way he put it was you're being very mean to your audience because they just want to enjoy the music. They don't want to hear all this fast stuff and they're like, oh, well, what is that? And overwhelming and all that. They want to enjoy your performance. So his whole thing was let your performance breathe. Don't, don't be tempted to play at the fastest possible thing. Who cares if it's that fast? Because that's not music anymore. That's just technical mm -hmm. stuff. Instead, make the music. Have a moment where, listen to this note. This is a beautiful note. Listen to this. And that's something, uh, again, you, you find that with, um, as you perform more, you find that you're much more able to do things like that, like to really control your tempo. And you can find these moments in your music where I think tonight we're just going to wait a little while on this and make yeah. it beautiful, you know. Mm -hmm. And those are all good good points and yeah exactly and i think that sometimes like the intention like it just can feel like things get running away from you like like oh my gosh how am i at this tempo now what do i do one thing that i like to i actually i stole this from someone i heard this at a i think it was another master class i forget who was by but i thought it was such a good brilliant idea so simple but brilliant and i never thought of it before is to make yourself actually have an elevated heart rate by inducing it and practicing like that. So instead of just like, you know, sitting down, march in place. You know, if you have stairs, just go up one stair, down one stair, do it for about 60 seconds. Give yourself like a 10 second recovery and then begin playing your piece at whatever you're doing it. And then you're actually since giving that, that heart rate sensation for flutist, it can feel like you're a little bit more out of breath and we need to use breath. So it can, it can help you experience that because then that sometimes that can snowball the snowball anxiety like i wasn't that nervous now i'm a little nervous now i'm starting to play oh my gosh how am i going to breathe through the rest of this this piece right and and now you're panicked now you're beginning to panic now i'm getting more nervous and the idea is is that you're you're nervous before you're, you're getting to play but as you go into the piece it should get get better so how to prepare for that to for me is like to actually make myself have a harder or higher heart rate and then you know know what that feels like and know what to do kind of having that 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 thing in, in mind um, as far as the tempos that's a little tricky it depends on what it is and and if me or the student knows your capacity so you have to know your capacity for how fast you're gonna go is this just a fast tempo that has a little bit more energy to it but I can swing with this and I'm good that's a different story like it might just be like a you know a, a faster energy Am I so fast that I have this section coming up right now that I am going to like flat out fall in my face, you know, because I am so fast. And that's a little bit different of a story and a different solution, but you have to know your limits. This is where practicing comes in. You have to know your limits and know that, 
okay, I'm going way too fast for me to be able to handle this right now, or, you know, I, I need to make an adjustment. So, you know, what I would do is that, you know, if you're, if you're working with an accompanist, their, it's their job to follow you. If you're just doing solo piano, probably you're in control list. But I will come back to a section, hopefully like the beginning of a new phrase, hopefully maybe the beginning of a new section. And then I'll just change the tempo. I'll do a little ritardando maybe and hopefully sit in the next tempo. Is that the best thing to do? Like, no, but it's, it's better than the alternative, which is to fall flat on your face when you're there. So that, you know, is knowing you're like maybe practicing it faster than you intend to a couple of times so that you know your limits. Um, and like you might surprise yourself like, gosh, I can really play this a lot faster than I thought. And it sounds kind of cool in this section. Maybe I wouldn't do that because like, like Stephen said, you know, that's not really the intention. If it's, it's, if it's like marked a leg run, you're playing it like, you know, vivace and like way out of the, the park, maybe not the, the best solution, but you can do it. You know, you know that you can do it. Um, so that was like a solution that I, that I found that was like really very helpful for a lot of my students. And we actually practiced marching in place almost, and you got to know yourself. Some, some students have to like run if they're really good in shape, like, you know, to get their heart rate up to that, to that level. And then you're, you're actually practicing for that elevated heart rate. That was kind of a cool little solution that, that, that I think. Yeah, that's awesome. Cause I, I firmly believe that you should do everything you can to experience the conditions that it's going to be. Uh, when you're out there performing, including things like um, I, I love for my students that are uh, piano students to try out the piano that they're going to play on. That's yeah. something, you know, cello players, flute players, we have our own instrument. Mm -hmm. So we take that around with us. We're very used to it. Whereas piano, you can be great on your piano at home and then you get to a new one. Ah, you know, what do I do with this? And knowing how to, you know, just respond to that, but also being prepared, you know, having practiced on it previously is very, very important, you know. Yeah, that's a huge disadvantage for piano. Like, you know, you can't travel with your piano unless you're like, you know. Yeah, there's a few you're of the, <laughs> like the concert pianists who actually, yeah, they, they've had a piano custom built for them by the, you know, so we're talking $600,000 pianos and mm -hmm. they, travel with it everywhere because i guess for them they're they are thinking that it's more important that i have my home piano so that i can present me me at my best you know rather than well maybe i'll be okay <laughs> yes yes interesting um yeah that's that's it, definitely that's a whole different thing. That's a whole thing, different thing. And we, we don't, yeah, no. like, yeah, yeah. And, and you, you're, you're kind of putting your trust and hope in a venue that they give you a piano that is presentable. But I've heard horror stories, you know, that sometimes it's out of your control, though. So this is where mind shift ha has to happen. Like, everyone is playing the same piano if it's a competition, you know. Um, you can only you can only do your best with what you're given at the moment, right? So it's it's just giving that up to the atmosphere. Like there is nothing, literally nothing I can do about this experience other than to get to know that the middle C is sticking down and I have to pull it up every time, you know, whatever that ends up being. Um, but you're, 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 there's nothing you can do about that. No. Literally nothing. So, so like just kind of laughing with it, I think could be helpful in that, in that regard. Like when you, when you're in that, that situation, yeah. that's, that's, that's nothing you can control. And the nice thing too is that you can you can in the moment you can tell yourself well you know this i'm doing the best i can this isn't you know it's not my fault the piano let's say the piano's out of tune well it's not your fault that's not anything you can do anything about in the moment so you just yeah you're like well okay that's maybe not the best performance but at least it's not something where i can it could like you we're talking about it can snowball in your head and be like oh no no I'm, you know I'm purposely getting all these notes out of tune. <laughs> Nothing to do with you. <laughs> yeah, 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 um, exactly. And along with the positive thinking, there is a, a, a um, it was actually a TED talk that I that I, I saw, but it really resonated with me and I read her books. Amy Cuddy is the, the, the author's name, but she didn't talk about necessarily, you know, performances, but she was just talking about how to give your, your best presentation, your best foot forward, and, and kind of talking about confidence, which is kind of like the same idea of, 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 of this performance thing. You know, we're trying to give an air of confidence, um, and especially in a performance, you can't go in tiptoeing, like with apologies, you know, you have to go in with confidence. 
um, even if you don't feel it. It's kind of the fake it until you make it concept, which is, I don't, I never really like that word, that, that, t that title, fake it until you make it, because it's like, you know, but the idea behind it is actually very powerful, and that is to like, you know, you have to trick yourself. It's such a p positive self-talk that you believe it. You know, that you have to say it over and over and over again. You have to think it over and over and over again until it actually becomes into being. And when you do that, you actually have a better presentation. You actually have a better presentation. But this girl, Amy Cuddy, she, scientist actually, scientist and author, um, she was talking about different power positions that you can put yourself in in order to get that state a little bit more um, readily. So she would put herself into these poses, like these, like she would call it Superman pose, where you put your hands like there, these like more powerful poses, and it, make yourself look in the mirror as you were doing it. And it seemed really silly to me, like, and that's really silly, but she had all this scientific data and research on like, you know, different performances when people did that before they went into a performance and they actually performed better. They, they actually performed better. And she, then they she showed these videos of like different power positions, you know, in an interview, this person was like this and how people perceive them. And so, you know, it's worth exploring, you know, anything you can do to get yourself into this power position that, you know, I really am owning this. Um, and I want to stress one thing that both Stephen said, and I, I totally agree with, is that this only works if you're prepared, you know, so like you, <laughs> the whole fake it till you make it thing can't work if you don't know your piece of music, right? Now, this doesn't mean that you don't have little um, you know, there's not a section in the music that like is just a little problematic, but like, you know, that you've prepared your very, very best that you didn't wait until five days before, you know, to like cram this piece of music. If it's something from memory that was required for memory, you didn't memorize it this week. It's been memorized a while, you know, you, you've done the work you've put, you put in the time you've done the work and you can tell yourself this because it's going to be really hard to tell yourself this. If you feel like you don't, you haven't done that. And there's all been situations where we had to learn a piece that we didn't feel quite as comfortable with it, that sometimes that happens. But the ideal situation is, is that you know the piece so well that you can tell yourself over and over and over again, I got this, I know this, I did it. You know, sometimes I have my students on their copy so they will see this. Mark in little slashes, one, two, three, four, slash, one, two, three, four, slash, and it'll just be this whole checker mark thing of all the times you've actually played it and you were really happy with it. Um, so that you can see that before you go into that, that competition, I got this. And, and so you can, you can really tell yourself that. So doing the work and then telling yourself that you've done the work are like the things that you can do beforehand to put yourself in a, in a more, um, powerful, um, mindset and, 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 and help with that. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I, that's one of the things that really kind of shifted my ability to perform well was, feeling prepared and in the moment when I'm performing I can tell myself you're ready for this mm -hmm. it's not like you're not ready you have practiced you've done your work and then I can relax a little bit and be you know in that moment and another thing that's really helped me a lot uh, as well is shifting from you know there's and, and this is something that we haven't brought up yet but there's you know there's a performer's ego operating a lot of times. And I'm like, look at me play. I'm so wonderful. That's a disaster waiting to happen when you're like that. Instead, focus on what is it about this piece that I like? What is it about this piece that I want to present to the audience? Because that's really our job is to present something to the audience and have them enjoy it. You know, it's not about, you know, look at how amazingly he played the C major scale. You know, <laughs> who cares, right? <laughs> So as soon as I could shift that perspective around, mm. I found that it was so much easier to play. And I had a lot more fun performing too, because right. instead of worrying about if I mess up that, you know, that's a notch on my ego, ugh, you know, instead of like, well, you know, if I mess up, it's, you know, it's just a little tiny blemish on this beautiful piece. Good point. And I mean, right now that's, it's even like, um, it's even more prominent right now is we have like very little live music that you can go and yeah. attend um, or be in an ensemble setting like that. And it's, you know, people miss it. You know, it, it's really saying how important the arts are. So as an artist, and we are all artists here, as an artist, 
you know, if you can give that ego up and be knowing that you have a gift and we all have gifts here um, and you're sharing that gift with others, that can be a powerful thing. It's like, you know, doing for others because, because we're all, I, I believe human beings are mostly kind, generous people. We want to give to us an artist in particular, musicians in particular wants to give a gift to people. So if you, if you just shift it around, I'm going to perform for these these people and i'm going to share this experience with them and we we are in a you know that, that can actually shift how you think about it that's a good point i like that a lot I like that a lot yeah okay should we do a little breathing here so let's do the breathing thing and um sure and so you know you have to find what works works for you i'm going to give you a couple of things i'm going to give you the quick and dirty one like especially like if you're let's let's just say that you're behind stage and it's, you only have a couple, like maybe a minute, a minute to do this. This one is great because you, it, it's, it's a quick one. So what you do is you breathe in as big as you possibly can. Breathe in from the diaphragm, right? And then fill it up to the chest and then hold it. And what I want you to do is sniff in three times. So you're going really, really full. And then exhale really big. This is behind the stage. This is not on the stage because it looks a little funny if you're doing this. Okay, so and you put your hands kind of towards your, so you can really feel this, put it towards your waist here. And... um. We want to fill in as much as possible, but then you're going to breathe up here. So we're going to breathe in for, let's say, four. So breathe in for four, two, three, four, and then hold. And now sniff in three times. So it's super full. Now hold that for four. And then let it all out in a big sigh. And you can even do audible ahs if you want. Do that three times, and you should feel a great amount of release. And this can help with the body tension, too, as we talked about the shoulders combination. Like, as you, what we're trying to do in this is fill up to the max so that you are so full and then you are so relaxed. Okay, and you can literally let your body. We're going to do this three times together. Just notice how you're feeling right now, and then notice how your body is feeling after doing this. Okay, so in four. Hold and then sniff three times. Hold two, three, four. Let it all out. Okay, do it again. In. Hold and now sniff through four, three times. Hold. All out. And last time. So breathe in big. Now sniff three times. And all out. Okay, so that's, that's one you can do behind stage. Um, a little bit longer one, if you can think about like preparation for meditation or uh, maybe you're in the practice room that, or just at your home before you leave, you know, take a, a longer time and you can combine this with the, what Steven mentioned is the, the, you know, the imagining of a successful performance. This would be really helpful. And, you know, I'm going to breathe low because we tend to breathe high in our body. We tend to breathe from our chest. We want to get the air going to the bottom of our lungs. And so I imagine a tire coming out around my entire abdomen. And you can feel this from the back. You can feel this from here. If you want to lay down, lay down completely on the floor. Put your hands over your stomach and you can feel your stomach rise. And then just find a cycle of, of counting. I like to do six in, hold for four, and then out for eight. That's kind of a nice cycle for me that I personally can find a, a relaxing flow in. So let's do a couple of these. So you're going to, if you want to put your hands near your stomach and see if you can breathe in gently, let's breathe in for four. Then we're going to hold for two and out for six. Okay, so in, hold, two, out for six two, three, blow like you're blowing through a straw, four, five, six, and then in, hold for two, one, two, out for six, roll out, in for four, hold for two, one, two, out for six. Um, and so you can do that as long as you want. And again, it, imagining that powerful, you're, you're in, it, when I say this, I mean, try to not go through, I, I don't personally, it wouldn't help me to go through my piece. I'm trying to calm down my mind. Instead, I'm just imagining the, the venue. I'm imagining people appreciating the music. I'm imagining a successful performance. 
I'm just imagining that that state of being, but not necessarily going through the motions of listening to my piece or um, going through the piece in my head or the ensemble. If it's in an ensemble, I'm just I'm literally just imagining myself being successful and and mo mostly breathing. If you want to just focus on the breath and the and not think about the performance at all, like a distractionary thing, that's fine. The other thing I sometimes do, especially if my actually, I'm gonna show you. Um, especially if my mind is going very um, strong, as I will put on a very, very simple, I don't even like anything with any um, harmonic structure. I, I use a drone. This is just one note. A drone is one note. Um, what's it called? I think this is it. Yeah, this is it. It's one note the whole time. And it fills in the sonic space to let all my thoughts kind of go out. This works for me. Other people, it might just be a nature sound or soundtrack. If you want to, if you want to fill up the sonic space with something other than your music, kind of like a, I think of it like a sorbet, clearing and cleaning before you know your your piece. And sometimes it's like running through your head, especially if you've been practicing it over and over and over again. And and you want to just clear it out. You know, sometimes some bird sounds, sometimes water sounds, sometimes that drone that really works for me. And it just clears it out completely, and then I can be you know focused and and prepared for my, um, for my piece. Um, so, um, lots of different breathings that you can do. Experiment with it. You can you can find something that works for you because what works for you is not going to always work for the next person. Um, you know, and, and like Stephen and I have said, you know, your symptoms of your of, a, of performing anxiety are always going to be different. Try and and be inventive of of what the possible problems are, and then figure out some solutions beforehand. Anxiety has a really hard time coexisting with information. If you have a solution to that, to that possible, and I say possible, you know, possible fear or problem, you're going to be able to navigate it um, much better and your performance will be much um, more controlled and you'll probably have a better experience when you're actually performing. Anything else in closing, Stephen? I, no, I, I, I... I, I love that, you know, and I, and I think that's very, very true. And one thing that, um, you know, I had shared earlier, but I'll, I'll just say it again, um, especially if for some reason it works a lot more with cello, but it's, I, I also use it on piano is while I'm performing, I'm very conscious, you know, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in. And what I try to do is coordinate my breathing with the phrasing and the music very much like a, a wind player or a singer would do. I try to find those natural points where it's good to breathe and then that helps me breathe and then I've solved that that problem of getting the heart rate a little too high and the you know the the lungs going what are you doing all that kind of stuff so um, and and then yeah I I've, I've always found that to be extremely successful for um, you know really bringing out the best in a performance you know yes um, and then the final thought is that we are hosting virtual recitals. I think Stephen is the next one up. I think it's July 31st. July 30th. 30th. Okay. So um, July 30th, and then there'll be another one in August, and there'll probably be some more in the in the future realms of that too. And as we said, practicing performance is actually really helpful. So you know, if you're if you're a person. Um, who's afraid of, or not afraid, I shouldn't say that, who needs more practice in, in performing, use these virtual experiences. It's a little different. I know it's in your house, but it is still a performance. There's still people watching you. You're still performing. Um, and the more you do this, the better you will get at it. It'll become nor more normalized. If you perform more like once a year, it's going to be less, you're going to be, you're going to be reacted to that more so because you haven't had that experience of performing more regularly, you know, so the more regularly or the more times you can perform, the better. And by the way, this goes for performing for family members, as Stephen said, little dinner parties, you know, balcony performances, driveway concerts, whatever is happening. We're in a different world right now. So like be creative with it. Call up your family and have, you know, cocktail hour and a performance of your choice of piece of music. That is all still counts as performing um, and it will get better as it goes along, right? Yeah. Well, this was fun. It was fun. It was fun. fun. Thank you, Stephen. This was, it was good to do 
Absolutely. With another person, that's, that's actually really fun. Um, and there's more classes this week. So I think all of us have this, this the, the listing, Stephen and Rem have this great music history class on Tuesday mornings at 1130 that's going to be going through. Um, that's really successful. I have a Monday one o'clock series that's kind of a combination between music theory and um, oral skills and I forget what I'm doing next time. But <laughs> look, at the, look at the sheet. We have lots of great ongoings on and thanks for coming with us or, or showing up today. Cool. Thank you guys. All right. See ya. I'm meeting. Bye.